Hello, I'm Lux. And this is Ember. And this is our random thoughts and theories on the online series Ruby. Thoughts and opinions, no pitchforks please. Thank you. Warning, there are spoilers ahead for season 1 and 2 of Ruby, so if you haven't seen it yet, please go and check them out. And then come back and check us out. Oh, this is a series I started following a little bit ago and I was like, well, this is pretty good. I kind of heard about it randomly. I used to watch Red vs. Blue, which is done by the same people, Rooster Teeth. But I just randomly stumbled onto this show that they started doing and kind of quickly fell in love with its quirkiness and, oh my god, awesome battles. I first caught the trailers as they were putting them up. And that's where Amber gets involved, because I sent her the trailers, like, forever ago, and, well, I'll let you go from there. Well, I watched two of them. I watched Red and I watched White, and then I eventually watched Yellow and Black, about halfway through season two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah, I first saw these trailers and went, damn, that's some really good action. <laughs> Wait, wait, this is going to be a series? Whoa. <laughs> and I just kept um, watching the trailers as they came out, and then I kind of forgot about it for a while and found out that, oh, it's actually on now. Go to watch it. Yay, the whole first season's out. Go watch it. Wait, there's going to be a second season? Yay. <laughs> and then started watching the second season and going, oh my god, they just went better. <laughs> Definitely one of my favorite series so far. <laughs> Just the action is top-notch. The story is interesting, though I have heard some people say it's a bit convoluted and distracting. And I'm like, no, I'm following it pretty easily so far. Especially with the little tidbits they've been giving us lately with those little short videos that start describing little bits of the world and how certain things work. And it also made me realize that, huh, there's kind of a connection here between this and Attack on Titan. At least the basics of it, because neither me or Amber have watched all of Attack on Titan. <laughs> no, but since you brought that up, may as well begin at the end. So, at the time of this video, the most recent World of Remnant video was about the Grimm. And there were a lot of parallels between the behaviors and actions of the Grimm and the Titans from Attack on Titan, including that they don't appear to need to attack to feed, that they leave animals alone, and that they very rarely squabble with each other. Also, the comparison of the disintegration of the Titan bodies and the disintegration of the Grim bodies. In Attack on Titan, I still don't get it. I'll admit I'm only 10 episodes in. With the Grims, though, it makes me think that they're more like some sort of malevolent spirit that's taken on physical form. It was something that feeds off of darkness. Because they always seem to gather or multiply in areas where there's high negativity. And they seem to be drawn to it, so I'm also thinking maybe they feed off of it and that's what their actual nourishment is. They just like attacking humans because that creates more negativity and more sorrow and so on and so forth. Also, it's very handy to kill hunters and huntresses since their job is to kill you. And the voice acting is pretty stellar in this series as well. Just lots of good female voice actresses. I like the characterization the voice actresses do for their characters, as it were. <laughs> My sentence is a bit redundant, but moving on. Now, and that's one of the nice things about the series. Even though if you go to the absolute basics, it's young hero team going up against forces that are stronger, better, more experienced. Okay, name every show ever with a hero theme. But they do have their own twists on it. You know, even though Blake could be categorized as the bookworm, Weiss is the popular snob, Ruby is the young innocent, and Yang is the brawler, they have a lot more going for each character than just that generic breakfast club stereotype. And just all the little things are leaving behind in the story that let us know that there's more going on with these characters, as you were saying. Just the way they behave, how they react to certain things. Like, the reason Weiss doesn't like Faunus goes back to the fact that Faunus had been going after, through uh, the White Fang, her family's business. And a lot of workers have been, you know, injured or hurt or killed. So she's basically been in that environment her entire life. So she kind of has some built-in negative emotions towards them. Which is probably a good thing that she didn't realize Blake was a Faunus until later, when she actually got to know her first. 
I just think it was funny how Penny just went, Oh, you mean that Fonix girl? And they're all like, um, what now? The ears! But she always wears a bow. <laughs> wow, we're idiots. Yeah, and I'm also trying to figure out, how the heck does that bow hide those ears? Because <laughs> in real life, bows don't work that way. <laughs> Questioning anime physics kills cat girls. Do you want Blake to die? <laughs> nope. Nope, she's a very nice character. <laughs> Oh, and the interactions between the characters is golden, too. <laughs> Especially the food fight at the beginning of Season 2. <laughs> that was like the best food fight ever. It was so insanely ridiculous and over the top. And how everyone was somehow creating their weapons out of food was just brilliant. <laughs> That's the thing. The series is really all over the place. You have an awesome comedic moment like that, and then you have... The more serious moments, for example, Yang cornering Blake and both giving us some backstory and forcing Blake to recognize that she's pushing herself too hard. They really do a good job of using backstory as an element in the current series, not just going, I'm going to tell you my backstory. No, I'm, I'm telling you my background story because, or this is a good time to bring up my backstory because it will help you understand what you are going through right now. Instead of just going, insert flashback here so that you have more information about the character. Mm -hmm. It's, my reasons are because the series is fun overall and it's just, let's move on to the weapon, shall we? It's a sigh, but it's also a gun. <laughs> Everything except John's sword, I think, is also a gun. Even the guns are also guns. <laughs> and then we have the canteen. It's also a flamethrower. Which, that was awesome. It's like, oh my god, that... That would keep his coffee warm all the time, wouldn't it? <laughs> uh, I didn't quite like that teacher at first, and then we started involving him more, and the story went, eh, I like him now. Because <laughs> at first he just seemed like the stereotypical, I am the guy who moves really fast. <laughs> and drinks lots of coffee. But as soon as there was an opportunity for them to expand and let us know more about the character, it was like, huh. We have reason to care about and like you. I just remembered something else that's funny. What the hell is that dog made out of? Seriously, first the mailing tube, and then firing him from the flamethrower? Because I'm like, what the? I just... What? <laughs> I would be not surprised if it reveals in the future that that dog's actually a friendly Grim or something. Because <laughs> that dog's like bulletproof. He can be used as a bullet. I think he was even a flaming bullet. <laughs> yes, he was on fire, curled up. It just, I mean, it was one thing for the comedic moment of, wait a minute, they sent the dog in a mailing tube? And then to have actually in a fight sequence. Mm -hmm. And speaking of the mailing tube scene, it was great because Blake's a cat. How she was reacting like a cat to the dog and the dog was just going, huh? <laughs> what a strange human. <laughs> and she's like, <laughs> Though I have to wonder, though, does that mean that there are issues between faunus? Would a feline and a canine faunus have that same sort of reaction? I don't think that we know what kind of faunus Blake's friend that she left behind in the White Fang was. Mm -mm. We know that the one faunus that goes to the school openly is a bunny, and the stowaway faunus, the blonde, is monkey theme. Specifically, he's themed after the Monkey King. Mm -hmm. So he's probably also themed more as a Hanuman Langer than just saying monkey. And then there's his friend, which I suddenly can't remember the name of. <laughs> <laughs> I just know he has a really awesome weapon that's also a gun. <laughs> it's a trident that's also a gun. Oh, Neptune. Yes, Neptune. <laughs> and that reminds me of the fight scene with the giant mech. And how they both got knocked off at one point, and then you cut back to them and going, Do you think they're okay? Oh yeah, they're fine. <laughs> <laughs> this series is just has so much good in it. And even in the first season where the episodes were like no more than five or six minutes long, they just managed to cram so much into that five or six minutes. <laughs> mm -hmm. And a lot of season one was set up and getting the teams built and establishing the layout. And then you really see the payout of that in season two. You see that they've hit their stride because the episodes are more consistently um, 14 to 15 minutes long and they tell a lot in there without having to give setup and stuff. Though I would like to have seen more of 
uh, Team Ruby's training because we get to that robot fight scene and they seem to have a lot of techniques that we never saw them develop or practice on. Yes, but how many times are they going to show us a technique? And, you know, well, I guess we could have had a training montage, but when you're doing 14 or 15 minute episodes, you do have to choose your content carefully. I mean, we know there's going to be training, and the classroom scenes that we have had have been more in the realm of character development and story development. Specifically world development, almost all the classroom scenes they showed were a lot of backstory on the world, like certain fights in the history that will probably become important to the story later. Like specifically, they mentioned one battle where the Faunus won because they could see at the night and the general messed up because, well, he didn't know that Faunus could see at night. <laughs> so just things like that, where showing a training montage wouldn't progress the story. Well, speaking of progressing the story, so probably move on to more of the side characters. You know, like the other teacher who's big and round, who boasts too much, or the ones that seem really important. Ozpin and Goodwitch. And Ironwood. And I have a bit of a theory around Ozpin. Here are some of the theories, folks. He seems to be associated with time a lot, so I'm thinking his semblance has something to do with time. Like, he can control it in some way, he can move through it, or he's a seer of some sort, which is a... There, I just popped into my head right now. He can see stuff that might happen. So he might be trying to do stuff to change it. This is why everyone seems to trust him a lot. <laughs> and in support of your theory, other than all the clock symbolism every time he is shown, including in the season two intro, we have him telling Ruby that he has made more mistakes than any person ever. He doesn't seem the type of person to boast. So I'm guessing he's had a lot of time to make mistakes. All right, on to a little bit of analysis of the season two intro song. I mean, obviously the song is great, and the thing that really stands out to me is the way particular lyrics tie to the visual. You have the lyric of, you know, no bridges left to burn, and you see Team Ruby on one side, and you see the school disappearing on the other. Implication that they're going to end up cutting ties with the school. One of the ones that really stands out to me is when we get the line of letting go of the things we love and the innocence of youth, but we're actually looking at Cinder on that line about love, which implies that she has had to let something go in order to follow the path that she is. And if you listen in the very first episode, Ruby Rose, where they have that introduction with a little bit of the world setup, the voice actors sound like their Osben and Cinder, which implies that perhaps they maybe even used to be colleagues. Hmm. And moving on to the bad guys, too. This is not theory. This is just one of my favorite characters in the show is Torchrick, just because he he seems like a bad guy. That's a kind of I would describe him as a neutral bad guy. He's neutral chaotic because he's out for himself. That's it. He just happens to be involved with these guys because it's you know, profitable for him right now, or it's convenient for him right now. So I think at one point we may see him flip sides because he's like, you know, the good guys are starting to win. Can I join you? <laughs> yeah, Torchwick is loyal only to himself. You know, he's joined up with these other forces because it seemed profitable. And I love Roman in captivity. Oh no, you got me. You've shown me the error of my ways. <laughs> like, oh my god, I would say you're totally overplaying it, except that you sound like that all the time and I love it. <laughs> I also like how I'm trying to interrogate you. Really? I see you're interrogating me. <laughs> I'm still smiling because I'm still here. <laughs> And me being imprisoned isn't screwing up the plan at all. You just think it's screwing up the plan. The bad guys have some very, very intricate plans that seem to be going on here. They seem to know a lot about what's going on in the good guy area. And they also seem to um, have, like, inns in very important places. Like, they got that mech that wasn't supposed to be out yet. <laughs> mm -hmm. So the bad guys seem to have a lot of inns, which isn't a good thing. <laughs> Because they are completely one step ahead of the good guys. Well, actually, more than one step ahead. They're like five or six, to use a chess term, moves ahead. They're like an entire game ahead of the good guys. Which isn't a good thing, because the good guys... Even though Ironwood seems to think that he has the best intentions, 
for what's going on and his plan will work because, you know, he has overwhelming forces. Yeah, specifically said in the intro in Ruby Rose, overwhelming, you may have overwhelming forces, but that doesn't give you any strength against us, basically. And Ospin goes, well, I have something else. <laughs> Mm -hmm. And something else I think is going to work much better, especially if we get to have all of the Beacon teams together, plus Penny. Oh god, yeah, speaking of side characters and theories and- oh my god, Penny. When, I, when she first popped up, I'm like, she's a robot! <laughs> I'm like, that's like the most obvious thing of obviousness. It was so obvious, when my dad was watching the show, he goes, that girl's a robot, right? <laughs> he doesn't pick up on a lot of stuff in shows, but- he goes, that's a robot, right? And I'm like, I look at him and go, wow. <laughs> I thought it was obvious, but that definitely tells me this is obvious. Mm -hmm. But she's going to have to go through a lot because she's been conditioned by Ironwood's rhetoric. So even though she and Ruby are friends, it's going to take a little bit to win her over to Team Ruby's train of thought. And she also has that danger of, since she's a mechanical creation, if she goes away from those who have been creating, protecting, and maintaining her, you know, how is she going to get repaired if she's damaged? How is she going to replenish the weaponry that she uses? Well, that part should be easier. Dust shop. <laughs> Though, bringing up her allows me to bring up the fact that every character has a theme around themselves. Like, Penny, she's a marionette. All of her attacks are based on strings and controlling things with strings, if you look at it. She, she's basically a marionette. And then you have Ruby, which I think the show's creator described her best. Ride, red Riding Hood with weapons, basically. Mm -hmm. And rose petals. Yes, lots of rose petals. And then you have Blake, who's like a cat. She's very themed around that. And she's also themed around Ninja, which also says cat. <laughs> mm -hmm. Then we have more of a cowboy slash western theme for Yang. It's just, I'm not quite sure what Weiss's is, but... I think maybe it's going to do with singers or high society. I'm not quite sure. It might even be like fairy tale princesses. Oh, Weiss strikes me as she's kind of a combination of princess, high society, and also white knight. Because she's definitely not the damsel in distress. And then you, of course, you have the Monkey King. You have Neptune, which is obviously themed after Neptune. <laughs> And then you have the gangster, that's Torchwick. And then you have the femme fatale for Cinder, the thief girl and her male partner. I'm currently thinking Rocket Grunts. <laughs> uh, I think they're more themed after other things. And I just remember the name. Her name is Emerald, but I... Not quite sure, other than green, what else her theme could be, because everyone else seems to have a distinct theme to them. So those two, I just haven't quite picked it out yet. Yeah, Thief seems too simplistic, even though they focus on the fact that she's a total pickpocket in the beginning. I thought I just realized green and Thief kind of go together if you ever read the comic 8-Bit Theater. Mm, also goes together in American society because our money is green. Green is also the cover of Envy. And that also reminds me of that great scene between her and Torchwick. Oh yes, the I steal from you, you steal from me. <laughs> mm-hmm. Two thieves going at each other. It's great! <laughs> and how about the lady with the umbrella? Oh yes, Neapolitan. She is just interesting, though that reminds me of those fight scenes on the train, which I were great, but I felt kind of gypped with how the bad guys got back up at the last moment. Gotcha! Especially the wife's fight, because she was owning him, and then suddenly, oh, I win! Thank you for that. <laughs> mm, yeah, I was feeling it more in Yang's fight, though, because Yang's semblance is the more you hit her, the more powerful she becomes. So how do you possibly manage to KO that? Good point. Maybe she has to be like, focusing or concentrating on it, or they were just distracted or weakened from previous fights that day, I don't know, but still. Also, if you find a bomb on the back of the train and realize that the carts in front of you have bombs as well, isn't it smart at that point to run for the front of the train? Except that it was kind of important to defuse the bombs, except why would anyone on Team Ruby know how to do that? Yeah, wouldn't it have been easier just to run to the front of the train and with your ultra-powerful weapons and skills, knock the train off the tracks? <laughs> yes, but then we would have had fewer fight sequences. Yeah, I know, but it's just that's the only problem I really had with that train sequence is like, wait a minute, you guys could knock the train off its tracks, so why don't you do that to stop it? 
because that seemed to be your theme to stop the train. And also, let's go back to Theoryland, uh, the mysterious stranger who rescues Yang. Oh, yes. I was actually going to move on to the after scenes, I should say the after credit scenes for the season two finale. Like, that particular scene, like, she looks a lot like Blake, except without ears. So maybe she's Blake from the future, or she could be Ruby's mom talking to Yang. Mm. Oh, Summer Rose. See, I was thinking Yang's mom because they had the same eyes. But the hair more matches Ruby, because you know, mm. it's black. Yeah, but following anime logic, parents and siblings and children usually don't look anything alike. I know Ruby's domestic, but I'm going to bet that that rule probably applies. After all, Ruby and Yang don't really look alike, and they're half-sibs. The fact that they're half-sisters is the reason I'm leaning towards this being Ruby's mom. Because of the black hair, I'm thinking Yang's mom would have blonde hair. That's how they got the two different hair colors, because they're half-sisters. And there's also... It somehow could be Blake from the future because we have Ospin who may be able to control time, so maybe working together. And we've already seen, based on previous events, that there is a bond between Yang and Blake. And also that portal thing she comes through, talking about the future person now, or dimension person, or current person, whatever. <laughs> yeah, but that also reminds me of Sender's ability. When she left the secured facility, went down a hall and was back at the dance. And more after credit scenes, that one with like, oh, oh my god, that guy from Blake's trailer! We get to actually see him in the series now! And he's also apparently a big player in this overall plan. And I really like how the trailers led into the series, specifically Blake and Yang's. They actually gave us like some prequel, pre-story, pre-show information. I like how the series points back to them. And it's really nice, especially since, you know, when Yang goes into the bar and everyone goes, oh, she's back again. <laughs> yeah, and I hadn't watched Yang's prior to that one. So when I went back and watched Yang, I was like, oh, that suddenly makes so much more sense. And now we get to see that guy from Blake's trailer th this upcoming season because I'm like, oh, wow, this is going to get good. Mm -hmm. So final thoughts? Um, let's see, obviously, love the series, very much enjoying it, great job, Rooster Teeth, keep it up. Mm-hmm. This is, like, one of my favorite online series right now that are online only. The only thing that tops it is Legend of Korra, but that wasn't a web series only when it started, so... <laughs> I really like the series, and I can't wait to see more. This has been our thoughts and theories on Ruby. Thanks for listening. If you want to keep track of what we've been up to, you can follow us on Tumblr. If you liked my art, please watch me on DeviantArt and follow me on Tumblr. If you really like my art and want some of your own, I am open for commissions. Links in the description.